afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a uh, hearing. And we are represent the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, this, today's hearing is going to be on the regulatory impediments to job creation in the Northeast. So I welcome all of you here today, and thank you to our uh, panel of witnesses. We will have three panels uh, throughout the course of the hearing. Uh, so this is, I think, a very exciting opportunity for my colleague, Mr. Kelly, and myself to hear the concerns and hear the regulations and hear <coughs> what businesses in agriculture and uh, even government municipalities are going through in order to comply with the sometimes onerous and sometimes very um, unrealistic government regulations. Before we begin today, uh, I know that many of you saw the Post Standard this morning, and I would just ask all of you to join me in a moment of silence. As you saw, the three soldiers from Fort Drum were killed in action in Afghanistan. They were uh, fathers, and husbands, and sons, and they're, we sit here today and we enjoy the freedom to come together to discuss the American way and the American dream and how to preserve it. And it is because of the duty, uh, the service, and the sacrifice that our military uh, provides for this nation. So if we could just remember them in a moment of silence. And to all the veterans in the room today, let, on behalf of my colleague, Mr. Kelly, and myself, thank you for your service to this nation. We are a great nation, and it is because of the service and the sacrifice of our military. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce, uh, sitting here uh, on the panel with me, another member of Congress, my good friend and colleague, also a freshman this year in Congress, Mike Kelly from Pennsylvania. <coughs> Mike's district uh, is about seven counties, and it stretches from Erie in, in the far northwestern corner to just north of Pittsburgh. So I am delighted that he is here with me today to hear your testimony. Mike. Um, is, sits also on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee with me, so uh, it's it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. In when we have our full committee hearings in Washington D.C., our Chairman Daryl Issa begins every meeting with the reading of the mission statement of the Oversight and Government Reform, and I'd like to um, to read that to you all today. I'd like you to understand what this committee is about and how, uh, what our goals are and what our mission statement is. Oversight Committee Mission Statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to the taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watch watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and to bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Thank you all for coming here today. I think that this is an exciting day for us in upstate New York. Today we will continue an effort that my subcommittee and the Oversight and Government Reform Committee have been examining since the beginning of this year. Our committee has focused on the regulatory impediments to job creation. We've heard from job creators across the country about how the federal government stifles job creation. And today we'll focus on the issues which affect job creation in upstate New York. The strength of the economy and unemployment are on the minds of most Americans. The nationwide unemployment rate hovers at about 9%. That unemployment figure doesn't even reflect the millions who have given up looking for work. The rate is approximately the same in the state of New York. 8,000 of our neighbors received unemployment extension benefits during the month of March. This is unacceptable. And we must create more jobs and turn this economy around for all New Yorkers. It is only appropriate that we are holding this hearing at the Southside Innovation Center, which is an incubator for small business job creation. Here, Bob Herz and his staff 
help entrepreneur businesses to get business off the ground and help people help themselves. I want to thank Bob and all of his staff here for hosting this event and for all of their efforts that they have done. Thank you, Bob, uh, to make this afternoon's hearing happen. This afternoon, we will hear from local job creators in business and in agriculture that conduct business right here in upstate New York. Our witnesses are construction workers, dairy, apple, berry farmers, defense contractors, and others that employ many of the local community and provide the necessary goods and services to our region. As we attempt to recover our economy and put people of the region back to work, we must begin to understand that the regulations these industries face on a daily basis threaten their attempt to survive. Industry faces an enormous amount of regulations from many federal agencies. This committee has heard from job creators about regulations from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Food and Drug Administration. The cumulative impact of regulations from all of these agencies is particularly harmful because of the difficulty of the implementation and the tremendous cost of compliance that it places on a business or a farm. These costs negatively impact important job growth. These regulations are a hidden tax on businesses. Worse yet, last week the EPA testified before a different House subcommittee and admitted that the EPA ignores the effects on jobs of the regulations they issue. <coughs> Local governments and municipalities are struggling to deal with the state of the economy and continuing to provide essential services to constituents while dealing with the federal bureaucracy. The practice of the federal government pushing unfunded mandates down to the states leaves local municipalities under intense pressure to make budgets work. These local governments already have major budgetary constraints and struggle to provide basic services for their constituents. Moreover, regulations that range from health care to street sign replacement pile on even more costs to local governments, together with those unfunded mandates. This hearing will allow businesses, farmers, and local <coughs> governments from New York to provide Congress with an opportunity to hear how federal agencies affect their ability to create jobs and provide for their communities. It's important that you're here today. It's important that we're here today so we can listen to you, listen to your concerns as the business, as businesses and as agriculture and as your municipalities. We've said over and over again that the government cannot create jobs. It is the private sector. The private sector is the backbone of our economy. They are the job creators. And the role of government should be to create an environment so businesses can succeed. So we're delighted to be here today, and we're honored to have all of you here today. We're looking forward to hear the testimony and to get started with our hearing. Thank you so much. I would now uh, yield time to Mr. Kelly for his opening statement. Well, thanks, Ms. Burkle. It's, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're on, right? Get right here. Okay. Uh, first of all, it is, it's really a privilege for me to be able to travel. I'm from Northwest Pennsylvania to be here with Ms. Burkle. We've been in Congress now uh, almost 100 days. And it's, it's good to be here. And I'm especially happy to be here at the Southside Innovation Center. It's an incubator. And when uh, Margaret Butler was showing me through, I've got to tell you, this is the place where businesses start. And when we talk about America, we talk about businesses that were started in their garage or in somebody's basement, or more important, somebody's head, and they were able to move it forward. There's no other place in the world you can do it except here. One thing that we're starting to realize, and I think that as we go through all these exercises, there was a movie out years ago called Groundhog Day, and what it was, it was the continuing frustration of figuring out how this all works. And i got to tell you, from a guy who comes from the private sector, I'm an automobile dealer in my real life, I don't know how in the world we've gotten to where we are, and, I, and more importantly, and that we don't change it. And this is not about Republicans or Democrats, this is about Americans. If we can't get this settled and get it backed off and make sure that the number one uh, the competitive nature that we have isn't some external factor, but actually our own government that makes it impossible for us to succeed, then we have failed mightily. So I'm glad to be here. We do want to listen to you. We have to hear what you have to say, and we have to take the message back to Washington, and we have to be able to articulate it the same way you do, with passion and intensity to get it fixed. So again, I applaud you for being here. Ms. Burkle, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and we're really interested in what you have to say. Thanks so much. 
this time, uh, for the record, we'll just uh, other members have seven days to submit testimony for the record and uh, any other extraneous material that they would like to submit. We will now welcome our first panel of um, witnesses this morning. First, we have Mr. Judd Godston, who is the chairman and CEO of Census. Good, good afternoon and welcome. Mr. Robert Simpson is the president of Center State Corporation for Economic Opportunity. Thank you very much for being here. It is the um, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses must be sworn in. So if I could ask you to stand and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear to or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that all witnesses I have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Um, when we have our, our big hearings in Washington, D.C., we uh, generally ask our panelists to limit their testimony to five minutes, and however, we have a little bit more leeway here today. So at this time, I'd ask Mr. Gostin to uh, begin with his opening statement. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Vice Chairman, Vice Chairwoman Burkle, Representative Kelly, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm Judd Gostin, CEO of the Census Corporation, aerospace and defense firm located in East Syracuse, New York. We started with five employees in 1985, now employ 600 people, including about 450 engineers and computer scientists. Although we sell globally, about three quarters of our revenues are from contracts with the U.S. government, notably the FAA and the Department of Defense. Air traffic systems, the larger of our two divisions, has a laudable track record of deploying innovative systems and design concepts to the FAA and NASA we are a leading supplier of surveillance and automation products that improve the safety, efficiency, and capacity of air travel. Two of our large FAA programs, ASDX and runway status lights, have been cited by the NTSB for their effectiveness in improving runway safety. Our Aerobond product provides the FAA airlines and airport authorities with a collaborative decision-making tool which, by conservative estimate, saves each airline user $5 million per year per airport and just reduced taxi time and carbon footprint. Defense and Security Systems, our other division, is executing two state-of-the-art expeditionary ground-based radar development programs for the FAA, but excuse me, for the Air Force and Marine Corps, both with the potential to transition into significant production contracts. We are also leveraging federal contracts along with our own R&D funding to develop a family of very small sensors and information processing, processing products to enhance the safety of our warfighters and the security of our borders. In that most jobs in our country are created by small and medium-sized companies, from a job creation perspective, the most onerous regulations are those that slow down the activities of such companies. Under Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, included the following guidance to defense acquisition professionals in a recent memo. Increased dynamic small business role in defense marketplace competition. Small businesses have repeatedly demonstrated their contribution to leading the nation in innovation and driving the economy by their example of hiring 65% of all new jobs and holding more patents than all the nation's universities and large corporations combined. The reality is that the government's de facto acquisition practices favor large and small companies to the disadvantage of medium-sized companies like Census. These are companies with annual revenues between $100 million and $1 billion. Large companies receive many new contracts as non-competed follow-ons to existing ones, while small companies receive significant contract loading by SBIR, Small Business, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, and a variety of other practices that are designated in statute to promote small business. Medium-sized companies typically do not have enough of a contract base to attract a sustaining level of follow-on awards and are too big to be eligible for SBIR awards. And yet, these companies are not only a primary source of job creation, they are also an exceedingly valuable, albeit underutilized, contributor to the effectiveness of government procurements. 
A number of medium-sized companies possess a combination of attributes rarely exhibited by large companies. Not only exceptional development production and life cycle support competence, but also a high degree of innovation, res responsiveness, and agility. Medium-sized companies are less limited by preconceptions of what can't be done and are not encumbered by excess overhead structure, bureaucracy, and dated infrastructure. They are also fully capable of leading major acquisitions. Census's standout record as a, pro as a prime contractor on major FAA and DOD programs is a case in point. By virtue of this attributes, medium-sized companies can provide the government with significant cost and schedule savings. And it's hard to remember a time when these savings were needed more. Here are some recommendations for regulatory changes that would promote job creation in medium-sized companies. Require substantial programs to begin with a competitive prototyping phase and encourage the inclusion of medium-sized businesses as prime contractor candidates. Enforce regulations that reduce the acquisition redirections and delays that have a disproportionate impact on medium-sized businesses. Develop fast-track versions of government oversight agencies like DCAA, DCMA, and the Earned Value Management Center that are not well matched to the pace and scale of medium-sized companies. Enforce small and medium-sized business set-aside goals. Institute a medium-sized business innovation development MBID program analogous to the SBIR program to provide timely ample funding for high payoff development efforts. Review and modify source selection criteria to eliminate biases against medium-sized firms. Recognizing that medium-sized companies competing for large contracts may not have an abundance of relevant past performance data. Modify proposal evaluation criteria to penalize poor past performance more than a lack of data. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on these very important issues. I would enjoy discussing any of my suggestions in more detail. Thank you very much. Mr. Simpson? Thank you, Congresswoman and Congressman Kelly, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I am Rob Simpson, President of Center State CEO. We are uh, the region's leading business uh, and economic development organization representing over 2,000 members ranging from sole proprietors and consulting companies uh, to service sector retail companies to our region's largest and finest employers uh, like, uh, uh, like Mr. Gosta sitting next to me. We, uh, in our efforts to understand how best we can serve our members, uh, regularly poll uh, those members of the business community and try to gauge from them uh, some common themes that stand out in their ability to do business with the federal government. There are three issues uh, that seem to be coming to mind more and more frequently over the course of the last several months, uh, and I'd like to speak briefly to each of them. The first is immigration. Second being issues as they relate to international trade. And third and final uh, relate to procurement, something that Jed was just talking about a moment ago. Let's start with immigration, and I'll share just a couple of examples. Uh, while many border states face uh, different immigration issues, here in New York State, uh, immigration issues uh, for our business community uh, have really been some of the stringent immigration rules in the U.S. have been a hindrance to our ability to grow and compete uh, as, as a region. Uh, so we have the third largest concentration of higher education uh, students in the country. We have over 140,000 students here in this region. A number of those students, many of those students, especially in schools like Syracuse University and Cornell, are international students uh, who come here on, uh, on, with F-1 visas who have the ability to stay and work in the United States for one year's time before we send them home to compete with U.S. companies working for you know, international businesses in their home country. We'd love to find a way to hold on to more of those students. Frankly, many of those students want to be here in the United States. They bring with them unique skills and expertise that can help New York companies and U.S. companies be competitive. Uh, and we really believe there's fertile ground here uh, to find, uh, to loosen those regulations and allow the United States to be the destination of choice for the smartest and brightest and most talented people all over the world. Uh, that's something that the business community would benefit from a great deal. Secondly, uh, we have many institutions, uh, healthcare institutions here in our region uh, that are critically important employers. 
Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, a situation in the U.S. where uh, J-1 graduate medical visas uh, are allocated across the country in a, uh, in a very rigid basis. Every state in the nation, whether it's North Dakota or New York, gets 30 of these J-1 visas. Uh, that obviously doesn't play to the favor of uh, many of our larger industrial states like Pennsylvania and New York here in the Northeast. We'd love to find a, a new methodology that would allow our healthcare institutions to find and train the best doctors to provide the highest quality health care uh, to, uh, to our individuals and also use that as a way, a jumping off point, to grow, uh, to continue to grow our healthcare sector, uh, which increasingly provides opportunities for, uh, for internet international healthcare delivery and a place where I think we can grow our regional economy. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, on the immigration front, uh, we have a number of local companies who've really been impacted by their ability to bring in, um, to bring in uh, workers from other countries, from their other plants around the world. We have many multinational corporations here with headquarters. Uh, and uh, one company, Inficon, who uh, has uh, who's done a significant amount of work uh, with a subsidiary in South Korea, who's wanted to bring some of those partners over to the U.S. in order to help them deliver uh, on a uh, on a project for uh, a major company, Samsung, a client of theirs, Samsung down in Texas. Uh, they've run into significant obstacles in bringing uh, those folks from South Korea to the United States, and are therefore unable to fulfill their obli their current obligations to their customer which puts that business in jeopardy here in the United States. So this is another area where we could use some support from the federal government. Third, uh, I guess the second main issue is as it relates to trade. We realize, uh, I think there's an increasing awareness in this region that 87% uh, of the global growth over the next five years will come from international markets. 95% of the world's consumers are outside of the United States. Things like the South Korea Free Trade Agreement provide real and robust economic opportunity for our regional businesses particularly here in New York and in places like Pennsylvania where agriculture is a really important component of our region's economies. And finally, uh, procurement, you know, the, the United States government spends over $425 billion a year on procuring goods and services. They're the largest uh, procurement uh, agency in, in the entire U.S. Uh, it is extremely difficult for small businesses to get listed with the GSA as, uh, uh, as preferred providers uh, for procurement. Anything that can be done to ease that would be greatly appreciated by our small business members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did we had um, a third panel? Mr. Boston, um, I'm going to yield myself five minutes and start to ask questions and then I'll ask my colleague to do the same. Um, in your testimony, you talk about the non-competed follow-ons that disadvantage the medium-sized companies. Can you expand upon that a little bit and help us understand what that means? Yeah. Uh, uh, often, we will describe products and, and, and uh, services to, to, uh, to the government uh, that appeals. That, that, you know, it's, a, it's a good solution to a compelling problem. and. Uh, it, they love to fund the development of production of it. It, it just it makes, it makes it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, and the response to us is, gosh, I wish we had a contract vehicle. If we only had a contract vehicle, we could add this, this uh, <coughs> work statement onto that. Uh, without having that, somehow, we have, to, we have to figure out another way. And often, uh, th there is no other easy way. And, and uh, as, a, as a small business, medium-sized business, uh, that's a fairly typical response of us. Uh, you know, I don't know of a contract you, you can use. Uh, but if, as a big business, with just a, just a large number of contracts, uh, it's, it, that, that's not nearly so much a problem. Now, the, these are not, I'm not suggesting for a minute that these follow-on contracts are not worthwhile, uh, they're not cost-effective, they often are all of those things. It's just that it is, in fact, a big disadvantage, a disadvantage to a small company not to have that, that rapid re uh, capability to respond. And who are you dealing with? Would that be the Department of Defense? When, when they I'm say I'm you thinking no mostly of the Department, of, the Department of Defense. It's also the FAA, but it's primarily the Department of Defense for us at this point in time. Yes. 
Mr. Simpson, can you um, just explain for me a little bit? You mentioned it, and I, I'm real not really not that familiar with the. Is it the uh, J1 graduate medical yes. education and how that works? Yeah, we've uh, been spending quite a bit of time talking with uh, the folks at the SUNY Upstate Medical University over this issue recently. Uh, you know, this, uh, apparently, uh, what happens is that uh, there are 30 of these visas that are made available to each state. That those visas, each state then distributes uh, those available visas to a number of the medical institutions uh, and healthcare institutions within the state that essentially allow them to bring in a medical professional, uh, uh, gr a graduate medical professional or a medical professional from overseas uh, to train and to work in their hospital. Typically, these are specialty providers, uh, uh, and they typically tend to be specialties for which, frankly, as uh, uh, that our medical institutions have a hard time filling here in the United States. Unfortunately, when New York State and uh, and North Dakota received the same level of, uh, of visa, uh, it puts states like ours at a competitive disadvantage. I, I wouldn't advocate for taking a single J-1 visa away from the state of North Dakota, but I would think that it might be in our best interest as a country to expand the number of visas that are made available, or at a minimum, provide the states with some additional flexibility when and where they have a critical shortage in a specialized profession that they would like to recruit internationally, to give them the flexibility they need to, to do that recruitment. Do you know who administers the J-1 program? Uh, I believe it's Customs and Immigration. But I, I, I will find the answer to that for you, Congressman. And has this formula been in place for? My understanding is it's been in place for about a decade, uh, that the rules prior to that were uh, even more onerous, I think, on many of the, the medical institutions. Um, and that, you know, I think what uh, they're seeking at this point is just to continue to find the law to make it a little bit more workable. Thank you. I'll yield to Mr. Kelly. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gaston, I, I think it's important, to, and one of the things that we found that by holding these hearings, we're able to expose some of the practices of the government and how difficult it is to get some of these contracts. When you talked about the SBIR awards, if you could, and, and, and I know it's a lengthy process, but for the sake of the people that don't go through this every day, and I know you have to in order to survive, just kind of walk us through it as quickly as you can, the difficulties of trying to get those contracts. Well, uh, SBIR contracts are, are uh, I, I think you need to have fewer than 500 people. It's either 450 or 500 people in order to be eligible for an SBIR contract. And they're multi-phase contracts. First phase is probably nowadays, uh, I date myself if I said 50,000, it's probably 100,000 right now, uh, in, in which you get to do some concept development. There's a second phase, which is substantially more than that, where you actually get to do some real development. And there's a third phase where you can take it into uh, into the commercial uh, into the commercial world. Um, that's a very important part of the contract loading for small businesses, and it's it's a great thing because it it's, it spurs innovation, it spurs new ideas. Uh, the government puts out a, 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 a document saying here are our tough problems. Anybody got any creative solutions? And small businesses will respond. Problem with being above 450, 500, you're not eligible for that, and uh, which means that that medium-sized companies, which not only have the innovation and responsiveness and agility and entrepreneurship of small companies, but they also have the critical mass to actually do substantial programs, much more so than small companies can do. Uh, can't get those good ideas. I uh, can't get contracts for those good ideas. So if there was an, an analogous program of what I would call mid, medium business, medium-sized business innovation development, as opposed to small business innovation research, uh, the government could get, could get access to, 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 uh, to, to good ideas for medium businesses that they really want. Uh, and uh, it would benefit the warfighters. It would benefit the people that fly. It would benefit all the users who are looking for quick, responses and innovative responses, low cost, cost effective responses to difficult problems. Well, one of the things we find is a lot of these standards, the bar is being set by people who've never actually done what you do, or never been involved in business or creating a business. So my question is, when they come up with exclusionary uh, criteria, do you ever have a chance to weigh in? Do they ever invite you to the table to sit down and say, you know what, help us get through this because obviously we're an impediment to you becoming successful or to America being successful. What could we do? 
to eliminate some of this because it's so onerous. And, I, and I, again, I go back to the American public. I don't think understands the biggest problem we have right now is not an external competition. It's an internal problem. We limit ourselves into what we can do. So if you could, I mean, if, are you ever invited to participate in any type of a panel discussion about how that would be fixed? Uh, uh, on occasion, right? Yes. Yes, I, I, I am. Um, this particular idea, when I, when I describe this, the senior members of the, of, of the, uh, the State Department, Team members of OSD, their response has been universally positive, and, they, and but it's a matter of law in this case. So here's a because the SBR program was 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 it was it, it, it's a it's a it's a U.S. law, and uh, there's no way that the Department of Defense could uh, could enact this by themselves. So it just becomes more difficult. Here's a situation where to make this happen, Congress, the Department of Defense, and contractors like myself have to get together. And and agree that, that it's a really good idea and, and try to make something happen. Um, none of it is easy. We not often ask to testify on how do we improve the system. Well, I know none of it's easy. <laughs> but you know what? But all of us working together to get it fixed would get it fixed. I, I don't like the fact there's very little sharing of data, there's very little data analysis, there's very little group think on how to fix these things. So I, I find that discouraging. I know. The Congresswoman and I, we talk about one on the floor. I, I, I don't know how we got to where we are, but we better find a way to get out of it and soon because we're really hurting folks like you. It's not easy. If, if it were, I'd feel bad. Okay. Not there yet. No, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. It's, it's the only place in the world we can fix it, so we'll get that done. Mr. Simpson, yes. uh, a little bit on the chorus agreement, and, and if you could kind of uh, expand a little bit on the opportunities that await American businesses if we're able to put together not only free, but fair trade agreements. And the other side of that is if we're going to have rules, we've got to make sure that we're the people that enforce them. We don't let people game us. Sure. Uh, I, I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, you know, part of the challenge, uh, specifically when you're talking about the Korea, is a couple of the major industry sectors where there is real market opportunity for U.S. businesses are in the automotive uh, sector, the high technology sector, and in the agricultural sector. These are, frankly, three areas that play to our region's strengths here in upstate New York. I think they play to the strengths of, of the Northeast United States. Um, we have watched our market share with, uh, with uh, Korea trade decline over the course of the last decade. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what that does is, is it's cost U.S. companies business and it's, uh, and it's cost us jobs. Um, growing our sort of worldview and our ability to do business internationally has to be, from our perspective, one of the fundamental strategies that we pursue uh, as a nation, if we want to be competitive globally in the long term, uh, so uh, we see, you know, there are opportunities for folks here, like our furniture manufacturers. Uh, we have a world-renowned furniture manufacturer in, in the Stickley Company that's very interested in, in doing increased business in Korea. Uh, companies like Nixon Gear that do automotive work. Uh, across the board, a number of uh, a number of our uh, of our dairy manufacturers and, uh, and agricultural producers are also very interested in that market opportunity. Uh, I was looking in, in your notes. It says, over the last 10 years, the U.S. has dropped from being the top exporter to Korea, with one-fifth of Korean imports to now being in third place with less than 10% market share. Uh, and, and this in, uh, is an observation of my own. I know there is uh, Hyundai and Kia have made substantial investments in West Point, Georgia, and Montgomery, Alabama. And in fact, half of the cars that are sold in this country are actually, the other Hyundai and Kia are actually produced locally. And I think one of the challenges we have is marketing the idea is that we no longer work within the confines of our country, the United States. We work in the entire globe. The market is huge. And when you said 95%, 95% of the market is outside. Of, of all the consumers in the world are outside okay. the United States. And 87% of the growth that economists predict is going to happen over the next five years is outside the United States borders. That's where the markets are. And from a business standpoint, uh, you know, we've been fortunate in this country to be able to sustain ourselves on domestic consumption for a very long time. Uh, I think as we've seen over the course of the last three and a half years, those days, while they may not be forever behind us, those days are changing. And I think it behooves us as a country to, to adapt rapidly and to encourage, as you said, fair trade agreements with companies with whom uh, we should be doing increased business. And, and we do know the way out of this economic mess we're in right now, we can't do it internally. We have to do it using the whole world as our, as our market. And we can compete. It's not a matter of our lack of will to compete or our lack of ability to compete or intellectually not being able to compete. My, my observation of being at these meetings is we have absolutely put ourselves in such a bad place. We limit ourselves and our ability to compete in the world. So I, 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 I'm with you on this, and 
and we'll, we're trying to get the, the Korean trade agreement through. We also have one with Colombia and Panama. I know there's some concerns with Colombia and Panama, and there are some concerns with the Korean agreement, but I think if we can get that message out and market it the right way so that people understand the upside for the United States, where the true gains are, because we will get people back to work doing what they do best, and that is taking care of their families and taking care of their communities. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I yield back. I just want to uh, this is uh, just comment, um, Mr. Gostin, if you could, you're talking about a program that would be analogous um, to SBIR for medium-sized programs. Have you thought about the, what that would look like? Is that something you could provide us with that information so that we would? Okay. Thank you. Well, on behalf of uh, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, we want to thank you both for being here today, for sharing your testimony with you. We, um, and I know I speak for my colleague, Mr. Kelly, we'd like to be partners with the, business, with the job creators and with businesses. Uh, we'd like to work with you and not, uh, and not put up obstacles. So although there are many right now, many obstacles, many regulations, many situations that businesses face in upstate New York, we'd like to work with you to, to begin to solve these problems, these issues, so that we can get our economy, not just in upstate New York, but across New York, across the country, get it back on track and do what's right for the American people. Uh, a lot of these things <coughs> and the purpose of this Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to help restore the American dream, to give entrepreneurs who are willing to take that risk, to spend money, <coughs> to create a dream, to empower them to be successful and not to achieve their success. So on behalf of our committee, thank you both for being here today and we appreciate your testimony very much. Thanks for having us. <laughs>